Is everybody ready? Great. As Marvin Minsky, a world-renowned cognitive scientist at MIT once said, quote, everything, including that which happens in our brains, depends on these and only these, a set of fixed deterministic laws, end quote. Because I strongly agree with this quote, I must affirm the following resolution. Resolved, science leaves no room for free will. Today I offer the following definitions. According to the Oxford Dictionary, science is defined as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Also, according to Oxford Dictionary, free will is defined as the power of acting without the constraint of necessity or fate, the ability to act at one's own discretion. Because the resolution specifically outlines the world of science, we must focus on what happens in the scientific world only. If a subject is brought up in today's debate that does not occur within the scientific world, it is untopical and therefore irre irrelevant. In order to win today's round, the negative has the burden to prove that in the field of science and only in the field of science, beings have the discretion to make their own choices. Ultimately, you'll be weighing today's round on whoever can best prove there is an ability to choose or not choose what happens in the field of science. Following this framework, I have the three following contentions. Contention one, the scientific method leaves no room for choice. The Oxford Dictionary defines a scientific method as a, quote, method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses, end quote. This method dictates every aspect of science and every experiment in theory that has any validity in the scientific world. The scientific method gives us with the ability to have structure within science, and without science, has no purpose or validity. Without the scientific method, every groundbreaking scientific breakthrough that has occurred would not have occurred, but with that, the scientific method also allows for no choice making to occur. In any experiment, while there may be an illusion that the experimenter has the ability to decide what he wants to study and how he wants to study, there is no free will. The experimenter is bound by strict scientific rules that confine them to only making observational and objective findings in order to validate the results, because otherwise the experiment becomes a form of pseudoscience. Additionally, through the scientific method, the experimenter must stay as objective as possible, otherwise the experiment itself becomes flawed and unreal. The experimenter is unable to intervene in the experiment in any exercise of choice or free will. They are limited to being passive observers. This means that in the world of science, the strict structure allows for no freedom in science due to the objective nature and laws that prohibit any choices to be allowed. Now contention two, science predetermines every choice that we can make pertaining to the scientific world in some point A's M theory. According to the Stephen Hawking Research Foundation, multidimensional theory involves a dimensional universe that is part of the M theory in which the weak and strong forces and gravity are unified and to which all the string theories belong. Shortly, the multidimensional theory dictates that there are multiple dimensions that are replicates of the very same universe, just with different limiting or non-limiting factors. Additionally, the M theory also umbrellas the multiverse theory, which is defined as a scientific theory that includes a possible infinite amount of realities of parallel universes. This means that in theory, every scenario is happening multiple times, but only in different dimensions and universes. There are literally infinite other things I could have done instead of debating today, and for each infinite outcome, there would exist a universe where that particular event happened. Now imagine how many different choices a person makes in a day, and don't forget that there are about 7 billion people on the Earth. That's a lot of universes. This basically means that we have no choice in what happens because any choice that we will ever supposedly make is actually going to be replicated in another universe with every option available being the result. This theory is widely supported and science mandates that we have no free will because M theory has already dictated how our multidimensional universe will happen. Now, contention three is that free will is an illusion. Our scientific world and universe is governed by the law of cause and effect. This means that everything that has happened up till now is in fact a direct result of what has happened before it, meaning that we have no ability to make a choice because one large action is in reality what has sent off everything that has happened up until now. Recent studies in neuroscience have concluded that we think is our perception of free will is a sub-working of our brain. It started with the discovery that the vast majority of the processing our brain does is subconscious. We ultimately have no idea why we prefer particular actions over others. It seems as though we are more passive observers of our own brain activity rather than than agents in changing that activity. We become aware of what our brains are thinking, but don't have any free will to preemptively alter it. Michio Kaku, a professor of theoretical physics based in New York, writes, quote, this means that in some sense, free will is a fake. Decisions are made ahead of time by the brain without the input of consciousness, and then later the brain tries to cover this up, as it wants to do, by claiming that the decision was conscious, end quote. It seems that our entire mental world is the result of pre-conscious neuronal action, which is beyond our own control. When we think of something, we are only observers becoming aware of our own thoughts, and our own choices are the result of our brain trying to explain our actions and decisions. University of California Davis neuroscientist Jesse Bankson concurs. Through purposeful intentions and desires and goals drive our decisions in a linear cause and effect kind of way, our finding shows that our decisions are also influenced by neural noise within any given moment. This random firing or noise may even be the carrier upon which our conscious rides, in the same way that radio static is used to carry a radio station. Neuroscience is constantly making progress, and the research has concluded that free will is just an illusion carried out by the brain, and therefore science has eradicated the very thought that free will is real. Therefore, I urge an affirmative ballot today. Thank you.
I stand in negation of the resolution which states result. Science leaves no room for free will. First, the Science Council defines science as the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. Thus, she should only evaluate, evaluate her points based on testable and empirical evidence as this is the most concrete method of proving or disproving the resolution. Second, Robert Kane, a university distinguished teaching professor at the University of Texas at Austin, defines free will as when we feel it is up to us when we choose and how we act. And this means we could have chosen or acted otherwise. This up to usness also suggests that the ultimate sources of our actions lie in us and not outside us and factors beyond our control. The burden of proof for the affirmative is that they must prove that decisions we make are ultimately not within us and from outside factors. There are three contentions. Contention one is that experiments that disprove free will are flawed. William Clem, PhD, senior professor of neuroscience at Texas a and University, writes on October 17th of 2010 how there are 12 categories of flawed thinking about free will. Issues that many scientists have glossed over include decisions that decisions are not often instantaneous, conscious realization that a decision has been made is delayed from the actual decision, decision making is not the only mental process going on, some willed action, as when first learning to play a musical instrument, must be freely willed because the subconscious mind cannot know ahead of free time what to do, conflicting data and interpretations have been ignored. Scientists do not yet have a good independent brain function measure for the conscious generation of intentions, choices, or decisions. Without such, it is not possible to measure the time at which a willed action occurs. He continues, saying how in the real world, subconscious and conscious minds interact and share duties. Deliberate new learning has to be mediated by free will because subconscious mind has not yet had a chance to learn. Dr. Mayer S. Osdemer gives further explanation as to why these studies are flawed, as these studies provide no proof whatsoever that brain activity could happen without conscious decision taking place. A method the logical flaw is that these experiments always involve a test subject fully aware of the choice they are going to make. Simply put, these categories are completely ignored in science today. Experiments to disprove free will overlook the large majority of these factors, never taking these into account. Studies conducted to prove free will are not accurate as they don't account for many of these 12 categories. Contention two is that complexities or trivialization leave a space for free will. Marco Gleiser, Appleton professor of natural philosophy and professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College, writes on January 15, 2014, our argument against free will goes that scientists will be able to predict what you will do before you. But such abstraction is mere fantasy. Machines can't measure our mental states in rapid suggestion if we don't even know how these states emerge. Any measurement that tracks billions of neurons and trillions of synapses in time is far-fetched. There is a risk of trivializing a question so that it can be analyzed quantitatively. Experiments in question here are limited to decisions that are far removed from the truly complex choices we make in our lives. When it comes to the choices we make in life, there is a spectrum of complexity and this is reflected in the issue of free will. There are two reasons as to prove that science leaves room for free will. The first is that science and machinery can never account for the complexity of our mental states. The other is that in order to do so would mean trivializing the question of free will, meaning it would remain open to both A, scrutiny, and B, interpretation as to what free will is, clearly leaving room for free will within the realm of science. Contention three is that quantum mechanics leave permanent room. George Musser writes on February 6, 2012, how within quantum mechanics there are four basic arguments for such a connection. One, quantum mechanics is indeterministic. Outcomes of measurements are chosen at random from the slate of possibilities. If quantum effects help conscious choices, they suffer the connection between us and the initial conditions of the universe. Two, when we conduct experiments on quantum particles, we exercise our free will. We, for example, we make choices about what precisely to ask of the particles. How those particles respond can depend on whether we really do. Three, if you can predict someone's decisions consistently, you need to take a full brain scan and, and simulate his or her thought processes. Yet quantum physics forbids non-destructive copying of particles, let alone whole brains. If you can never observe the loss of free will, then you should doubt whether it is re ever really lost. Four, quantum physics is time symmetric. So we are as justified in saying that our choice is set the cosmic initial conditions as the other way around. Tom Siegfried also writes on February 26 of 2014, further elaborating how free will requires the ability to make a choice that cannot have been predicted. Quantum physics reduces the possibility of such predictions to probabilities, but nevertheless constrains those choices to obeying equations. Some pose, some actions can't be predicted. The free choice door cracks open a bit. Equations for predicting the future always need the initial conditions as input into the math. The initial conditions of the universe included elements of unpredictability that prevent equations from ever forecasting every single aspect of the future. If so, there would be some freedom in the universe, a certain strong kind of physical unpredictability, lack of determination, even probabilistic determination by knowable external factors. 
Because of this, there is a re there are four reasons as to why this leaves no room for free, why science leaves room for free will. The first is because of how quantum mechanics is indeterministic, essentially meaning that because of the severed connection between us and the initial conditions of the universe, free will is not thereby determined. Another reason is because uh, specifically of what Tom Siegfried writes, how when the initial conditions of the universe are set, the input of the math ends up going skewed, as we aren't able to predict the future because of the lack of an input, thereby providing an idea for some future. We good? I'm good for cross-ups, yeah. Yeah. Hi. You want to like ask the first question? I'll stand up here. Yeah, sure. So since I spoke first, I'll take the first question. So if I can prove that there is no free will in general, like in the world as a whole, can I still win that there's no free will in science? No, because the resolution is specifically about science. So if you can prove that the whole world has room for science, that would not prove that science does not leave room for free will. Okay, uh, if, you can take a question. Okay, you said that it'd be pseudoscience if uh, scientists aren't able, that scientists have to stick to the scientific method. Are scientists allowed to deviate in terms of what the hypothesis is for the initial scientific method? So in terms of what the hypothesis is, a scientist is allowed to morph and change their hypothesis based on those observations that they made, on um, the observations that they can't really intervene with. The issue of free will with science comes in when you notice that a scientist is a passive observer of something. They can't actively intervene with their free will in in an experiment because that would deter the experiment from being an actual scientific experiment due to the scientific method. If, if I prove that certain types of science require a scientist's intervention beforehand, do I prove that science, therefore, therefore the scientific no, method? No, you'd need to prove that you directly, like, with an experiment to show, you need to prove that a scientist needs to intervene during the experiment, not before, because the before is the setup that is really part of the scientific method. Is it okay if I ask a question now? Yeah. So you're talking a lot about the idea of predictability and probabilistic determination in your idea that free will does exist. Yes. However, if everything is based upon a probability, doesn't that mean that there's actually no choice, but it's just left up to probability? No, because probability is a determination of choice. The quantum mechanic argument that I talk about specifically states how quantum mechanics leave an area for free will given several different factors such as the initial conditions of the universe. Okay, how so actually let's talk about those functions. initial conditions. Where did those initial conditions come from? Of the universe? Yeah. Uh, that's a very okay. long, so, that's a very so, long so that's where the degrees of freedom come from, right? That's where you're saying there was this initial freedom. But after that, everything else is set upon that. So if you have equations that are deterministic, set upon one unit of freedom, but we're talking about the now, wouldn't that mean that the now is still deterministic based on that past experience? No, because that's the question of whether determinism is actually fatalism, which will be brought up in the block. Okay. I mean, determinism isn't inherently a, a, fatal, a fatalistic thing. I gotcha. You can ask a question. Uh, sure. So, uh, on M theory, how does the multiverse prove that free will, that science leaves no room for free will. Right, so the Even idea, though multiverse is uh, still a theory that's being debated today. So multiverse is still a theory that's being debated today, but it's supported by a lot of scientists. Now what multiverse says is that each time that you make a quote unquote choice, every other choice has been made too by a different you in the same universe. So you're never actually making a choice. You just take this set path of action, path of action that was set for you and you appear in this multiverse part of these infinite universes in which you made, you didn't even make that decision, but in which that event occurred, right? So that proves that since every possible choice happens, you don't actually make a choice that affects the future, and you were affected by outside forces that would create those universes. Yeah, I think that's that's fine. That's fine. I'm gonna take running prep starting now. I'm gonna end prep there. Okay. That's 140 taken, yep. so 320 left. Okay. All right. I'm just gonna be as a brief off brief off time roadmap. I'm gonna be doing a quick overview at the top, and then going down his case. Is everybody ready? 
So as an overview, we're sticking to the definition of free will, being the idea that you exert a choice with no outside interferences, with no necessity or fate. So if I prove that fate or necessity have a hand in involving what choices people make in the realm of science, then I win the round. Another reason that I could win the round is if I prove that there is no free will in general, because although this may seem extra topical, if I prove that there is no free will in general, that proves that there is no free will in the world of science. However, you will see that my contentions specifically apply to science as well, so there is no need to fear that I'm being irrelevant. Now let's go on to his contention. So his first contention is about how experiments are faulty when it comes to determining whether or not there is free will. Now first, let's cross apply my first point, saying that with experiments in general, if we're going to talk about how experiments can test for free will, there is no way for a scientist to actually intervene in those experiments because they are a passive observer. The role of the scientist is to set up some sort of a hypothesis that they predetermined and that was predetermined from them that came from their mind from the observations that they made. Then they make a hypothesis and they test it by observing situations that they set up. In this way, the scientist is a passive observer. So the fact that there is something wrong with these experiments doesn't really go to show that. But now my second response is if they say that studies have issues with talking about free will, there are a couple of issues with this point. They say that then there is no scientific evidence for the existence of free will or against it for free will because they're saying that ultimately studies that conduct things about free will are ultimately flawed. So you can't accept any of my opponent's evidence either because they're saying that inherently studies about free will are flawed. So you have to discount this evidence that is also from 2010 and predates some of the studies that I cite in my case. So you can't weigh this idea of the first contention that says that studies that are talking about free will are inherently flawed. Now, onto their second contention, which was talking about studies and predictability and the idea of the subconscious. Now, one point that they made was that the subconscious has time to learn, or doesn't have time to learn, so the subconscious must be free will, must be exercising its free will and makes a choice to learn something. However, the subconscious learns from outside stimuli. For example, the example that my opponent predicted, that my opponent brought up, was the idea of learning a musical instrument. You learn a musical instrument when somebody outside of you helps you learn a musical instrument. Then your subconscious registers that from an outside force, and you learn how to do that. And that person who learned how to do it in a musical instrument was also taught by somebody else. There's no free will in this exchange. It is all predetermined by the role of the teacher and you being the student. So this idea of the subconscious really doesn't hold any weight in terms of proving that there is free will. Now, my opponent also talks a lot about this idea of predictability and that if computers and science can't predict something, that means that free will exists. However, there is an issue with computers and science right now. It's simple that the universe is so complex with the idea of M theory, with multiple universes, that some computers and science can handle the fact that there are so many different possibilities and can't account for the fact that there really is no free will, just infinite choices. So you can't really put any weight on their argument that if something isn't predictable, then it's not free will. For example, you can't really predict my actions, but you can say that because I had some sort of mental quality that forced me to make a decision, that happened even though it wasn't my free will. So predictability doesn't have any tie into free will. Now finally, the point of quantum mechanics, I'm going to counter this with the idea of Schrodinger's cat. So the idea of Schrodinger's cat is if you put a cat in a box with an atomic, uh, something like a radioactive atom, until you open it, it is both alive and dead. This is the idea of quantum mechanics, that it is both at the same time. In this case, this is because there is no direct intervention between the observer and the object being observed. So without that, we can see that there is no free will that the observer can exert on the cat to say that it is dead or alive. So there is no existence of free will in the world of quantum mechanics. And again, all of these ideas are predictable and probable. Those don't hold any weight on free will. And I'm going to end my rebuttal with a really quick thought experiment. So if you were put into a room, you would do something first, right? And then let's say you went back in time and you went into that same room. You would do the same thing over again because that's what you were going to do initially. Like say if I were going to go into a room, the first thing I would do would be to go talk to my friend. If you rolled back time, I would do the same thing. In idea, everything is predetermined by some set of mental values that you have and some events that happened, say, five years ago. Then you can keep tracing that back and back and back until the first event that might have actually had freedom. Up until then, everything else has been predetermined, and that is why I urge an affirmative ballot. I'm not going to say that. You good? Yeah, I'm fine. I don't know if the posters are. I'm going to take some prep starting now. Alright, uh, got 3.32 left. <laughs> it's going to be uh, brief on my case then. Cool. 
there are a couple different arguments that you want to take note of. The first is the Robert is the Robert Kane evidence that says that free will is up to us and that ultimate sources of our actions are not outside us. This is going to be incredibly important in the round when you consider Nika's contentions about whether the subconscious means we have free will or not. The second thing is that they that she says that we they cannot that we, you cannot accept my evidence uh, because you cannot accept my evidence either because uh, we also talk about free will. However, our evidence specific to studies such as the Labet experiments over whether the over, over whether uh, the subconscious played present over this that directly answers her points, not mine. My points are about whether quantum mechanics actually have those sort of complexities or not, not whether the subconscious has those complexities. The second thing is is that she said that the subconscious learns from outside stimuli. That's not stimuli. That's not the argument here. The argument here is that in order to take an initial action to for order in order for the subconscious to actually develop in that method, the conscious mind needs. To to actually take that initial step. The subconscious cannot make the initial conscious mind learn the piano. However, the subconscious mind can assist once the first, once the conscious mind has made the decision to have the, to play the piano. Again, she also says that uh, that uh, quantum mechanics don't have a weight on free will. And however, we do, given the fact that quantum mechanics is inherently indeterministic, leaving open a, p a possibility of how co how quantum affects how conscious choices because they separate connection between us and the initial conditions of the universe. This is, you're going to want to cross apply this onto the multiverse point. However, quantum mechanics specifically indicates that when we sever ourselves from the initial conditions of the universe, the multiverse theory has a massive hole in whether or not it is actually initially conditioned to this. This is going to play into her determinism argument, which I'm going to answer here. Robert Kane specifically says that we should not confuse determinism with fatalism. That fatalism is the view that whatever is going to happen is going to happen no matter what we do. However, determinism alone does not imply such a consequence. What we decide and what we do make a difference in how things turn out, often an enormous difference, even if determinism should be true. A fatalist believes that there is no use in struggling against it, that it will happen however we may strive to prevent it. However, determinism is simply the belief that whatever is going to happen will happen in the end eventually. However, however free will still leaves that room. Now, let's just go on to the case. Uh, on Nika's first point, she talks about how uh, the scientific method limits choice. However, quantum mechanics show that particles can only respond based on scientific action in free manners. She also said that it's pseudoscience given, given that a scientist gives no freedom in science due to the fact that due to the fact of hypotheses being needed to test based on observations. However, scientists are able to vary the initial action while still being taken part of the scientific method. Keep in mind that observation is one of the first steps you do in the scientific method. The scientist makes the choice based off those observations. The next point is multiverse theory. I have several answers to this. The first is from uh, George Dvorsky, a contributing editor, who talks about how the entire the idea that the entire universe is quantum mechanical in nature brings up that micro scale of that macro scale event into the picture upsets the half century's work of work that preceded him. The two different worlds that argued can and must be linked. Ever work to reconcile the micro and with the macro by making the different the, by making the case that no arbitrary decision needs to be invoked to delineate the two realms. He considered the universal wave function a mathematical list of every single consideration of a quantum object. Whatever it did was apply Schrodinger's wave function equation to the entire universe, which is now known as the ever postulate. All its isolated systems evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. However, all of these universes are still connected by initial choices made by people. Multiverse, multiversal effects are still created by the independent free choices that we make now or by other lives make now. While free choices may not, while in a multiversal scale, Free choice may not have an existence. In this universe, free choices still matter, which is uh, still connected to the resolutional question of whether science in this universe leaves room for free will. Again, on the, the, will, of, uh, the will of the universe in the, causal, in the causal affectional argument, that is just determinism. That is what that argument was talking about. And you should cross apply my first contention because their studies don't take into account active conscious subconscious connections, which means that, there, that and also our free will definition gives us access to this as the subconscious is still within us and still makes a part of that decision. Since I spoke first, may I have the first question? Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about how these two this 2010 paper says that these studies are not working. You said something about the subconscious being the reason that it's not a good study? Uh, sure. Uh, that evidence talks about how there are several categories that uh, studies of the subconscious leave out, such as how machinery now doesn't have the implications for okay. scientific methods. So if I don't, the subconscious if I don't use one of those studies that talks about the subconscious, then I'm fine, right? Uh, not only that, but also the fact that uh, analysis of whether or not we have free will is skewed and biased through to things such as data okay. and time and analysis such it. as that. The scientific method in particular can, also leaves out these you factors. You can take a question. Uh, sure. On the uh, idea that we uh, 
Let's see, let's see, that the subconscious learns from outside stimuli. How does this not prove that we have an independent choice based on conscious activity? It proves that you don't have a choice because the subconscious learns things from its environment and then acts on those because the subconscious is wired to do so. Like subconsciously we are wired to say if we learn how to do this, then we know how to do this. We don't choose to learn how to play the piano. We are taught and then our subconscious just does that. That's not a choice that is involved. So do, so do I not have the initial choice to learn the piano? No, you don't because you were taught you uh, something caused you like a mental state in you caused you to go seek out a piano teacher. That piano teacher is determined to teach you. This is not, none of this is involved with a, like a choice of free will. This is all set by mental values in your head. Is it okay if I ask a question now? Yeah. So you were talking about how in order to take an initial condition, the conscious needs to take that first step. Is there a scientific basis for the idea of the subconscious or the conscious taking that first step? Yes, because the subconscious is because the subconscious is derivative of the actions. Also, the evidence specifically like states how. What is that evidence? Like, are you looking at synapses? Or are you looking at the conscious making a decision? We're looking at conscious making a decision. We're also taking a look at all of the analyses done on the question of free will and conscious subconscious relations. Given that studies conducted on the subconscious to disprove free will argue that because the subconscious went slightly first, that proves it. However, the subconscious cannot take action unless the initial decision had been made in the first place. Okay, so you're arguing that the subconscious can't take action unless the conscious acts first. Unless the conscious, yes. Unless okay, the conscious perfect. makes the decision, the, the subconscious cannot do anything. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, you talked about how uh, when we, that you should that Schroeder's cat and how there's no direct intervention in that area yeah. uh, how is not how is opening the box not an idea of direct intervention in the Schroeder's cat function opening the box is that first off it's the act of observation but second off like opening the box is not a choice that the scientist made the scientist is a passive observer in this case right the idea is that the scientist is a passive observer of whether or not the cat is alive or dead opening the box is simply the method that they take to observe that would be following the scientific method like they don't have a choice in saying okay let's open the box and like now the cat is dead they open the box and observe that the cat is dead they have no free will in deciding whether or not that cat is alive or dead is it okay if I take a question now yeah so you're talking about this micro could you really quickly I'm gonna take some prep for this could you explain sure. this micro macro stuff the micro macro stuff sure yeah. that argument is basically talking about how while on the macro the multiversal theory exists the micro is what matters and the most important okay that. perfect that makes a lot of sense so actually. given that like science may not leave room for their uh, for free will in the grand scheme of the multiverse however uh, in this universe where the resolution of question still tags precedent we're able to prove that okay. science does Sweet. leave room for free will Thank as you. our actions in this universe still matter 20 seconds to ask that question. I'm going to sit down and then take some more prep starting now. Okay, I'm going to end prep there. I took 145, so I'm saying 1 minute 35 left. I can't do math. <laughs> Does that sound all right? 135 left. Okay, perfect. I'm not privy to flex prep, <laughs> so it's, it's fine. All right. This is a three-minute speech, just checking. Okay. Perfect. As an off-time roadmap, I'm going to be going over a quick overview of the framework, clearing up some line-by-line, -line, and then going down the voters of today's round. Is everybody ready? Okay, so first, as an overview. So my opponent conceded the framework that if I prove that there exists no free will in the world in general, I also prove that there exists no free will in the world of science. That was conceded, so if I can prove that there's no free will in general, then we, uh, I win the round. Uh, secondly, clearing up some line-by-line. -line. So there's this whole macro-micro idea saying that free will matters in this world and that they're linked. However, for example, Newton's laws operate in this world, right? And they determine what happens a lot. Based on your mass, you behave a certain way when affected by a certain force. Based on your acceleration at the moment, you'll be affected a certain way by a different force affecting you because of your momentum. All these different laws interacting, especially in this universe, because we might not be able to account for the multiverse, show that free will doesn't really exist because we are subject to the laws of science and the laws of matter that conduct how we operate. Now, the second idea of line by line that I need to clear up is the idea of the subconscious. Now, first off, when I asked on cross sex, there was no real scientific basis that my opponent could provide for why the conscious operates first. There was no talk about like how synapses are going to be firing the conscious first before the subconscious. There was no talk about studies that were actually concretely done, like nothing was cited, so you can't really weigh that. Now, secondly, there's this idea that the free will is an illusion. One of my first contentions that I read that was actually dropped by my opponent in rebuttal, and I will bring up again that free will is an illusion created by our brains to cover up the idea that the conscious doesn't actually have any role in our decision 
making, but actually the subconscious does everything. Now, for my third response to the subconscious idea, you're going to look to Kuka and Jensen from the University of New York and from the University of California, Davis, which I cited in my constructive, that show that decisions are made by the brain first, and we are only observers of our brain activity. Now, the voters in today's round are going to be science and the fact that free will is an illusion. Now, first on science, my first point that I brought up was M theory, the idea of the multiverse, showing that you don't actually make a decision outside of some sort of fate or necessity governing you because your fate is to be existing in multiple multiverses in which you have made every single decision possible. So ultimately, you're not really making a decision affected by no outside factor, but instead you're just pulling into this role of events that will put you into infinite universes. Now, the second idea is of Newton's laws, the idea that you will behave based on a certain set of laws that govern the laws of motion, the laws of matter, and there are more laws outside of Newton's laws. But the idea is that the world of physical matter and science is governed by a set of laws that cannot be broken based off of free will. You are affected by a certain outside necessity. And the idea of quantum mechanics, of Schrodinger's cat, where you are a passive observer of everything that occurs, so you have no free will to intervene in any sort of scientific experiment and try to affect anything. Because even if you do and you somehow successfully affect something, that becomes pseudoscience because you intervene in the experiment. Experiments that are intervened in are not science. Now the second idea is that free will is an illusion and you're going to look to the sources I cited in my first constructed, Michio Kuki, and from the University of California Davis saying that free will is really an illusion that our brains constructed in order to cover up the fact that our subconscious is actually deciding everything that we do. Ultimately this round comes down to the fact that humans are mere observers of all of our brain activity and of all of the laws of nature, not actual agents that intervene in it to change any sort of fate. Observers that are affected by outside factors as abides by both his definition of free will and my definition of free will. Thus, I can only see a ballot and affirmation in today's round. It's going to be easy, bro. I'm going to start it now. Alright, it's going to be time. 141. There are a couple of reasons why I've won today's round. The first is how the first is the conceded point about how scientific studies cannot take into account the entire idea of the mental state. The specifically, uh, Marco Gleiser, the Appleton professor of natural philosophy and a professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College, specifically states how how uh, subtract that machines aren't able to measure the, all of our mental state in rapid succession if we don't even know how the state emerged, and also the fact that any measurement that needs to track billions of neurons and turn into synapses in time is far fetched. This is in direct contrast to Nico's point about how the subconscious makes it so that all of our free will is illusion given that current science today cannot prove that free will is an illusion we can only give guesstimates at best in order in order to do this the other reason it shows is that this also means that the question of free will in science is trivialized meaning because it's open still open to scrutiny and interpretation that's what's completely conceded out of the constructed another idea that Nika talks about is the is the will of the universe and cause and effect however this is simply deter is this simply the idea of determinism that once an effect that once a cause has happened the effect is guaranteed Guaranteed to occur. However, I specifically talked about how this does not prove that free will is limited. However, the, what this does prove is that a certain action will be taken. This does not prove that the action is guaranteed to be taken the same every time. If Nika punches me in the face, there's no real idea as to what I will do. There's a certain effect or probability given in quantum mechanics of what I will do, but there is no single guarantee, thus meaning that freedom overall and free will is still not an illusion and is still not guaranteed. The reason why you're going to be voting affirmative, uh, not, not you're going to be voting negative today is because uh, the idea of quantum mechanics idea that because the quantum mechanics in itself is inherently indeterministic meaning that the outcomes of the measurements are chosen at random from a slate of potential possibilities which means that when we also conduct experiments on product on particle quantum particles we're able to exercise our free will inherently as we make choices specifically of what precisely to ask of the particles keep in mind what I said in cross X about how uh, uh, given in the scientific the scientific method we have observations that take place we base what we will do in our hypotheses off of those methods. That is still within the scientific method and still takes place. While we aren't able to interfere with, with, 
during the experiment, we're still able to interfere after or before the experiment in order to get in order to test and see what causes, making it not a pseudoscience, but rather a key part of the scientific method. Nika also talked about how Newton's laws operate based on the idea of uh, how uh, based on max, x is determined, and how based on other things, things are determined. Again, this is what I was talking about and how this, this is what I'm talking about, how given that quantum mechanics proves that just because of a certain mass, the particles in themselves mean that there is an inherent indeterminance as to what will occur. Another thing that Nika talks about is how, is how because, we're a passive, because we're a passive observer in the realm of science, we're not able to prove anything. Again, that comes down to the quantum mechanics argument. Uh, again, we've won this round based on the Marco Gleiser evidence that complexities in science aren't, con aren't continued and how uh, Nika has conceded that quantum, that quantum mechanics and quantum particles leave an inherent uh, space for free will. I'm going to take the rest of my prep starting now. And I think that that's the end of the clip. So, step up. As a brief off-time roadmap, I'll be going over an overview of the round at the beginning, some quick issues that need to be cleared up, and then the voters in today's round. Now as an overview, again, the framework has been conceded, saying that if I prove that there exists no free will in general, as well as in the world of science, I win the round as the affirmation. Now first of some issues, so Thomas told me that I conceded some scientific studies showing that studies can do anything to prove that free will exists or doesn't exist. But first off, this evidence is from 2010, technologies have improved since then. Second off, this is not what my whole case is based off. I'm not completely basing this idea off of evidence and studies, so you can't even weigh that completely and disregard everything that I say. Now, he also talks about how quantum mechanics are indeterministic, we can make choices after However, this comes into the idea that humans don't have free will in general, which I will address later in my speech. But second off, quantum mechanics are based off of a series of probabilistic equations, saying the probability of this happening is this, the probability of that happening is that, based off of some initial condition that may have had some trace of freedom. However, the fact that everything is based off of probabilities shows that there is no choice involved. Now, I he was talking about the idea of Newton's laws. However, Newton's laws really only conflict with his side, not with mine. Now, the voters in today's round are going to be science, and the fact that free will is an illusion, and on science, the multiverse theory clearly proves that you don't ever actually make a choice that isn't affected by outside fate, but instead, you really never make a choice because every single choice that you could have made has already happened. You don't ever actually make a decision that affects fate and that isn't affected by fate itself. Now, Newton's results also show that you are governed by a set of laws, and this is a larger metaphor that can be applied to the fact that free will is an illusion. Now, let's take this thought experiment that Thomas had of if I punch him in the face. Now, if I punched him in the face at that moment, he would have a certain reaction to that. Now, if we rewind in the same exact situation, Tom is in the same exact state of mind. I'm in the same exact state of mind. And I punch him again, he will do the exact same thing because he has certain values that are preset that will condition him to respond in a certain way to my punch. This shows that he has no free will in deciding how he reacts to my punch, but instead his subconscious makes a decision based off of certain values to react to my punch. And this reacts with every single decision that you sort of make in real life. It is governed by a set of pre -valu predetermined values, thus showing that you really have no free will in general. Thus, because of science and because free will is an illusion, you can only sign an affirmative ballot today. All right, I'm gonna start my prep. We got 141 starting now. There are a couple reasons as to why I won the round today. The first is because of the conceded Gleiser evidence. Nika has one real response to this, and that is that is that it's from 2010, and that tag is proved, improved. However, no machine today can is still able to is able to track billions of neurons now, or to map out the entire mental state, because there are questions still remaining about how the mental state exists. This means that that point doesn't even apply, as Nika hasn't given a clear example as to how this is still possible. The warrants in the evidence are still applicable. The next is that she says is that quantum 
quantum mechanics is based on probability of the initial condi conditions, which shows how there's no choice. However, pro however, the fact that there are probabilities shows that fate is not determined, as there is a range of options that we are able to choose. That is the conceded Muzzer evidence that talks about how quantum mechanics is inherently indeterministic. While there are a set range of possibilities, that means that I, as a person, still have a choice, meaning thus that science today still leaves room. This also proves that, that free will as a whole is not that uh, free will as a whole still is still able to exist because of the conceded Gleiser evidence itself. It talks about how that free will is not an illusion based on the idea of the subconscious or the multiverse theory, given that mental processes processes aren't able to be tracked in itself. The, um, another argument is that of the multiverse theory. However, Dvorsky specifically talks about this in that the multiversal that the multiversal theory is initially linked to a set choice, a set choice that we make is able to be given. Nika also talks about how in the multiversal theory, uh, multiversal theory, if she, if we were able to rewind time, I would do the same exact thing. However, quantum mechanics is a direct counter to this idea. As Musser talks specifically about how if you're able to predict someone's decision consistently, that would require an idea of a full brain scan and a simulation of a current thought process. Of current thought processes in this universe. However, that is completely against the idea in science of quantum mechanics that we are that the, that forbids the non-destructive copying of a particle. Another idea that was conceded is that how when we conduct experiments, we're able to exercise our free will in the scientific method based on observations and are able to change therefore of in the scientific method. Let me set this first. This, oh, is, gonna, good, this is gonna die in like oh, no. ten minutes. Well, no. Good round. Good round.